Thank you. Hola. It's great to be here today. I wish I was in uh, Spain uh, with you. And uh, thank you to the foundation for inviting me today. And it's good to be with my good friend, uh, former administrator, uh, Charlie Bolden. Um, what I thought I would do in the 20 minutes or so that I have is to give you an overview of where space exploration comes from and where I see it going and my personal uh, journey uh, that, that has uh, led me from being one of the pioneers of space exploration to now seeing and standing on the, uh, the cusp of a new uh, chapter in space exploration and where I see us going. I wanna start this morning 100 years ago uh, in the 1920s because it's important for me to share with you, especially people new to our industry. You know, we take so much for granted today. We take for granted that space is an exciting new um, uh, marketplace. There's entrepreneurs worldwide. Um, there's new companies being formed every day. Innovation is just assumed in space exploration, but it wasn't always this way. For most of the history of space exploration, it was government controlled and government dominated. Operations were run by the governments. <clears throat> but when we started out 100 years ago in the 1920s, space exploration was international. It involved the, the first pioneers of, of our industry, the Germans, the Russians, the Romanians, Americans, French, Europeans. But then just before World War II, the government stepped in, in Germany, in Russia, in America, and they took rocket travel and they made it something special, something different. And in the 1930s and the 1940s, rocket travel became part of missile development. And, and space exploration took a different path than did aviation, automobiles, and all the other frontier uh, industries of the last century. <clears throat> because space went down a pathway with government control of all aspects of space exploration. We even have space agencies. And I have to tell you, and, and no offense to my good friend, Charlie Bolden, but I'm even against space agencies. Why do we have space agencies? We don't have internet agencies. There's no government organization for computers. There's no car agencies, but we have space agencies. So space has been treated differently because of its importance in, in, in the strategic interests of our countries. But in the last two decades, what the, we've gone full circle. <clears throat> and today we're back to where we started, where Space exploration has become a normal marketplace where you have government, you have industry, you have universities. And my career, I've seen that arc. And when I started, uh, let me take a moment and talk about how I started in the industry. I started 30 something years ago. And when I started, the United States was single point dependent on getting to and from space. And that was through the space shuttle. And it's a remarkable that a great spacefaring nation like the United States could only send crew and most of our cargo to and from space in one vehicle. And since then, and that was then that vehicle was government owned and government operated. And about 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, we decided, <clears throat> excuse me, to take a different path. And that was where the government would become the customer. And the government would say, we need a launch vehicle here. We need a crew here. And boy, what a revolution has taken place in the last, oh, let's say 15 years. Today, anybody know how many launch vehicles there are around the world? There must be a hundred companies now working to develop launch vehicles. In the United States, we have SpaceX doing crew and pretty soon we'll have Boeing. We have the Chinese doing crew. We have the Russians doing crew. Um, cargo is all over the world. Uh, and I happen to think pretty soon the Europeans will have a crew capability as well. 
And now we have satellites. They're no longer big satellites the size of a school bus. Now we have small satellites and they're doing all sorts of good things like environmental monitoring, um, the, the pollution control, um, monitoring all sorts of urban uh, developments. Um, they monitor the size of uh, how many cars are in parking lots so you can tell how a business is doing. Um, the, the revolution in what we call CubeSats, the innovation has also been extraordinary. And the, the next area where we're going to see a revolution is in the destinations. And I'll talk about that for a moment. But um, the destinations, uh, just as 15 years ago, the United States was single point dependent on getting to and from space uh, with the space shuttle. Today, we remain single point dependent on our destination. And that's the International Space Station. Right now, humanity has two space stations. The Chinese have one and the uh, Western world, the United States, Russia, Japan, Canada, and Europe. We have the International Space Station. I'm not so happy about that. I'm not so happy that once again, in the West, we have one space station. I'm not so happy that humanity has two space stations. And I'm not so happy that the Chinese and the International Space Station are in different orbits and different inclinations, and they can't even work together. And so what's going to happen in the next oh, four or five years is we're, going, we're entering an era now where we're going to see private space stations develop. And there should be two, three, possibly four in different orbits. And here the government, NASA, in my country, the government will be a customer, one of many. So in sort of completing sort of the beginning of the talk today, we've gone a full circle where in the beginning space exploration was set out by entrepreneurs and founders who thought space travel, rocket travel, as it was called a hundred years ago, they thought rocket travel would be just like aviation and just like the cars. And it wasn't, it developed, we've developed differently. We developed with space agencies. We had the superpower race between the Soviets and the Americans. We have NASA who's guiding and is really a leader throughout the world. And now we're seeing a new transition. And that transition is where people like myself and my colleagues uh, you know, really thrive. And that's where you have entrepreneurs, private capital, and the government is one customer of many. So let me take a moment and just talk about uh, a little bit more about my history. Um, in the 19, so as I said, I've been in the industry for over 30 years. And when I began, as I said, single point dependent, there was the government controlled every aspect uh, of, uh, of our program. And I thought that was wrong. And so I tried along with some other colleagues to, to nudge, to push the American government into behaving more like a customer. I set up the first fund on uh, Wall Street for commercial space. We raised $10 million. This was about 1988 or 1989. And I'm not so I shouldn't say this, but we lost uh, we lost all our money and we lost all 10 million because it was very difficult at that time to be commercial. And then later, uh, I was in the uh, last year, of the Reagan administration and helped them set up the first policy shops outside of NASA within the American government at the Department of Commerce, again, to make space more of a normal place to do business. And then after I was in the Reagan administration, I uh, did something very unusual. I began to work for the Russians. And this was in the mid nineties under Boris Yeltsin. And we believed very strongly. We were very hopeful that Russia would become part of the international community. And for nine years, uh, I was the only American who worked for the manned space program. I helped privatize the Russian space station Mir uh, I was there when the first tourists went to the Mir. We did commercials. We did all sort of uh, sort all sort of new commercial uh, businesses on board the human rated Mir space station. In 2000, I was a head of a Dutch company called Mircorp, and we leased the Russian space station for two years. 
And I have to tell you, uh, I don't know how much uh, Charlie wants to get into it, but his predecessor, uh, Dan Golden, was very upset that uh, we had commercialized the Russian space station Mir, and we helped privatize the Russian space program. And at that point, the Russians were going down a very commercial pathway. And I learned a lot. I learned a great deal about how you run a space station. And ironically, for an American, I learned it from uh, the Russians and particularly the Russian organization, Energia. Mir Corp failed. We failed as a commercial project. But I'm very proud that when we failed, we had close to $180 million in backlog. We signed Mark Burnett, who has a still today an American TV show, Survivor, to do a game show where the winners would go to space. We signed the tourist Dennis Tito who, to fly to the Mir space station. He later went um, to the International Space Station. We signed some research organizations to do research on the Mir. But most importantly, even though Mir Corp failed, it was a data point in 1988, 1999, 2000, 2001. It was a data point that you could have a small company, this was Dutch, backed by Americans working with space agencies, in this case, the Russians. It was a data point that you could take an existing space station and use it with another business model. And our business model was purely commercial. And so even though Mir Corp failed, it's an, it was an important lesson for the community. During when I was CEO of Mir Corp, we spoke to Sir Richard Branson, who, of course, went on to do Virgin Galactic. We spoke to Elon Musk, who was thinking of his first steps in space. And folks were very interested. The entrepreneurs at the turn of this century were very interested in what we did with Mir Corp. And so we proved that you could have a space station and it could be commercial. Again, it's that it's that innovation that you see when a marketplace is not driven only by the government, when it has that, what we call in uh, Washington, that public-private partnership where, uh, where uh, the government has one role, the private sector has another, and once the government's behaving as a customer, then you see private capital coming in. And we've seen this amazing ecosystem take place today. Absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, I was in Spain a couple of weeks ago, and it was remarkable for me to meet with some of the companies there. I was in uh, Italy, uh, Luxembourg, um, and, and just to see the ecosystem that's developed around the world. And it's developed because now we have that public-private partnership where the governments of the world are behaving as commercial customers, allowing the imagination of the entrepreneurs to take place. So finally, um, what I, I, so I should say, after I worked for the Russians, I uh, helped set up a company called Nanorax. That was 12 years ago in 2009. And Nanorax, we, we started in the garage, but not in, not in California, not in Silicon Valley. We started in the garage in Houston, Texas. And we grew Nanorax to be the largest commercial user of the International Space Station. And it's hard for people to understand today, but when we were getting going at Nanorax in 2009, 2010, we were the first company in the world to own and market our own research hardware on board the International Space Station or in space. Before Nanorax, the idea of private ownership of hardware, marketing to private customers, where NASA did not say, you're gonna go to space. It was Nanorax that made that determination in our partnership with, with NASA, where we charged a fee and we kept the money. All of this that we take for granted today was new when we began at Nanorax in 2009. So slowly, I, as CEO of uh, Nanorax, I built it up. We grew up customer by customer. We did uh, ex uh, more research hardware on the station. We, we uh, did an external platform built by Airbus uh, outside the station. 
The biggest piece of hardware we did is called the Bishop uh, airlock. It's now permanently docked to the International Space Station. Somehow we self-funded that at a customer revenue and it cost us almost uh, 25 million US dollars. And that's a lot for us. And, and uh, we grew Nanorax to have customers in over 30 countries. Uh, we also did, I'm very proud, the only commercial project with the Chinese with Beijing Institute of Technology. Um, and Administrator Bolden was kind enough to allow that to go forward in the Obama administration. And it was a very important signal that we wanted space to be another place to do business. Um, Nanorax has customers throughout the, the world in Europe. Uh, in the Middle East and Asia. And we also now have, have competitors. We have competitors in Europe uh, and, we, and everywhere there's competitors and that's what a marketplace is. And one of the decisions I made early on when I joined Nanorax was I didn't want to patent our first product, which was uh, a nano lab, we called it, a small lab that attached to a power source that would allow research to take place in a standardized hardware that uh, mimics the, is like the CubeSat standardization. And why didn't I patent it? I didn't patent it because I wanted an ecosystem to develop. I wanted competition to come. And so before the pandemic, when I used to be on panels with uh, Ice Cube and uh, others, Space Tango, I would enjoy reminding them that, uh, you know, our decision not to patent the NanoLab has led to um, the, the uh, growth of the uh, commercial research community. So then about a, a year ago, I was able to, as we say in the business, exit Nanorax. We sold Nanorax to Voyager Space Holdings. And now I'm president of International and Space Stations for Voyager. And Voyager is one of the winners of this new era, of private space stations. There's four teams, uh, Axiom, uh, Nanorax, Voyager, uh, Blue Origin, Sierra Nevada, and Northrop Grumman. And we're ushering in a new era of private space stations. They'll be located in different orbits where NASA is one customer of many. ESA, the Europeans are trying to figure out how they're going uh, to be involved in this new era. And this is all happening for several reasons. One, the International Space Station will, will not last longer than 2030. We'll see how long it does last. So we're getting ready for the transition. We don't want a space station gap. We don't want a period where uh, the West has no access to robust space platforms in low Earth orbit. And while we in America return to the moon and, and the rest of humanity goes, uh, vo goes on the voyage to the moon for the first time, uh, we have to make sure that the commitment we've made in low Earth orbit, the ecosystem, the marketplace, the robust space transportation, and now multiple destinations, in-space services for research, for Earth observation, for in-space manufacturing, for all sorts of markets, some we understand and some we don't know about yet, as well as space tourism, that exciting new marketplace we're seeing now with suborbital finally coming of age and orbital tourism. We wanna make sure that we have multiple space stations in low earth orbit, so this marketplace continues to grow. Uh, sort of final comments, and, and then I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to, uh, to Charlie and uh, to Charlie. Um, but final comments uh, I, I would be that, you know, we're having this uh, conversation uh, during the horrific events taking place in uh, Ukraine. Um, I know how personal and, and uh, close this is for everybody in Europe. Uh, but I, I do wanna say that uh, not only am I remain a believer in the value of international, but I am today more of a believer in the value of working together across nations. If we want space to really mean something to us, if we want it to be a new chapter in who we are as human beings, I'm really hopeful that in space, uh, in space exploration, in the, on the new private space stations, on colonies, on the moon, and one day on Mars, we do go as much as we can as humanity 
we we move forward for the species we don't move forward for any one nation um, and so that's really my 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 thought for the day i believe in international at voyager we believe in international we're looking forward to having very strong relations with uh, europe on in this new era of space stations and uh, with all the nations and peoples of the world so I guess that's about it. It's uh, all about innovation. And in the hundred years of space exploration, we've come full circle. The entrepreneurs are back. Government is a customer and the future does look, despite all the negative news we see, the future looks very bright for space exploration. So thank you. With that, I'll turn it uh, back over to the team. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a real pressure to, it's a real pressure, uh, to hear you. So now just, I leave it to both of you, okay? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hey, Marcy, thanks very much. And Jeff, thank you so very much. Let me uh, let me kind of add on to one thing Jeff said. Uh, you know, my thoughts and prayers are with the people of Ukraine today, uh, as I think all of us are. Um, and, and that actually um, will will probably dovetail into a little bit of the discussion that I hope Jeffrey and I can have. Let me let me start out, Jeff. I, you know, I, I think, you know, I consider myself an earthling. Uh, I'm an earthling first and, and then an American, and then I can go on down the line. But uh, I, I applaud you and, and uh, your uh, wishing us that, that we, we do our exploration unified as, uh, as humanity and, and not as an individual nation. Uh, I don't think there's any disagreement whatsoever between you and I. I was a little bit surprised uh, to hear you in the beginning uh, say that you didn't feel we we should have space agencies, and I and so I want to I want to probe that a, a little bit because I um I guess what I would ask would how how do we develop uh, an exploration enterprise um, without government investment through uh, you know through agencies if you will how do we how do we get the ball rolling what serves as the impetus uh what the, for the commercial sector without without government agencies right I, I i do like uh and it's good to be with you charlie i do like to say that line it does uh, get people to react and and let me say first off that charlie and i are having this conversation as two americans and the way we do space exploration in the United States uh, may is different than the way it's done in India and the way it's done in Europe. And we're not here to tell anyone in Europe or India or anywhere else how to do space exploration. So, uh, you know, we should have that 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 roof over us. Having said that, Charlie, um, my point is a simple one. Um, we we encourage the government encouraged the growth of aviation and uh, you know for the last hundred years. And they did it without an aviation agency. In the United States, it was part of what we call the FAA, okay? And we have an automobile uh, marketplace. We have a bioengineering marketplace. We have a internet and so on and so on and so on. But because of John F. Kennedy, because of the symbolism of our um, contest or our race with the Soviets, uh, the Kennedy administration made a symbol out of space exploration, and they created one government agency for this one activity. And so that's my gentle pushback, is there is not another activity of governments around the world that has one agency devoted to it. And when I look back on our innovation in space in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, I just wonder if we would have done better um, as a commercial venture as a commercial marketplace if we did it the way we do everything else in America, where the research for space was done by the National Science Foundation. Uh, some of the transportation was done by the uh, uh, FAA, the, the, you know, which handles transportation and so on. So that's, that's my point. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And um, for those who are not American, you know, there is a, and, and let me make a slight clarification. Uh, in America, our agencies are of, um, they're multiple kinds. The one that, that I think Jeffrey and I both have a hard time with are the regulatory agencies. Yes. Uh, yes. NASA is not a regulatory agency. So uh, I kind of, and, and I'm being, I'm, let me be very blunt, I'm being partial here because I, even though I'm no longer in NASA, I still speak of we and us when I talk about NASA, but, but it's, 
it is um, it, it takes us having to explain to people that NASA is not a regulatory agency. So we can't tell people what to do and what not to do. And, and we have always viewed our job as being one of these agencies that participates in revolutions. So if you look at NASA's, it, it, NASA's origin comes from what was called the National uh, Aeronautics, the Nas NACA, right. the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, when we were running behind the rest of the world and developing airplanes. And so the government decided that we needed somebody to take the reins and begin to develop airplanes as well as people had done in other countries. And that was the old NACA. When we were beat to space by the Russians, by the Soviets, actually, with, with Soyuz, uh, as, as Jeffrey said, the government decided that, boy, we need to get we need to catch up first, and then we need to get ahead and stay ahead. And so NASA was created as, a, as an adjunct to NACA, and it some subsumed, if you will, the old NACA, such that it did not just space, but, but aeronautics also. So just a slight, um, for people who don't understand how we operate in the United States, NASA is not a regulatory agency. But let me go back to something Jeff talked about, revolutions. And I love it. It's destinations. That is the revolution of today. Um, and so, Jeff, how do we, um, uh, you know, how do we get the private sector to, to invest their funds in some of the cutting edge things that are absolutely necessary in terms of making more destinations? I think we have too many launch providers. Yes. Uh, we have an excess of launch providers, but, but you and I don't seem to be able to convince investors and, uh, and people who, who are risk takers that we've got to have more destinations. And, and I believe we need them in multiple orbits, multiple altitudes, so that all kinds of stuff can, can, can happen. So how do we, how do we push uh, the envelope, if you will, in getting the private sector to, to want to invest more in destinations so that we don't just have Axiom and, and um, you know, and Nanorack slash uh, Voyager space and the Chinese. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Uh, I think about it all the time, as you can imagine, uh, Charlie. Um, one answer for first, I'll say that, uh, you know, we agree that there's too many launch vehicles, but it's wonderful to see the entrepreneurial spirit and who the heck knows who's going to be the winner. You know, we all assume it's uh, the deep pockets of Jeff Bezos and Elon. But when you look 30 years from now, who knows? Who knows? Um, so it's wonderful to see. But it, it, it takes a lot less funding to launch a launch vehicle and develop to develop a launch vehicle than at this point in time to do a destination. So the way I like to say it, Charlie, is we're going to have two eras in destinations, I in private sector destinations. I believe this era is the uh, coming up as the ISS retires will be the only era where we really manufacture the platforms and the destinations on the ground. And so that's very expensive. You have to make the, uh, the, the space station, you have to launch it, all expensive. In the future, let's say 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I think we'll be doing more manufacturing in space, reuse of upper stages, reuse of spent hardware that's no longer needed. And there I think we'll see the cost come down. But to answer your question today, I fear that destinations are expensive today. Uh, we have to show people that the ISS is truly coming down. And you know the administration has mm -hmm. been saying it. Um, NASA has been saying it, and we have to get a couple of wins on the ISS. This hurts me to say, but we haven't had a fantastic commercial win on the ISS. We've had tourists, we've had some patents, but we haven't had somebody manufacture yet something on the station and they can buy 10 Teslas because they, they, they manufactured that. So we need a great commercial win and I, then the, the floodgates open up the way the markets work. So we really need that first market and we need the price to come down. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholly. And you know, today on the International Space Station, we have three 3D printers, three, three right. varieties of 3D printers. When we started, all we could do was plastics. Uh, right. But, it, and, and you know this very well because you've actually helped kids get their things to space right. to do some 3D printing. But today we can take powders, we can take metal, we can do everything else. And um, we look to the day where there is what I call massless launch, uh, where we use smaller launch vehicles to take the material, the feedstock, if you will, 
for 3D printers and we begin to manufacture the components for satellites, for uh, transportation vehicles to take us on to Mars or back to the lunar surface. So um, quick question for you here. It's the question for me that I'm still struggling with. Um, is there a closed business case for a human uh, space flight, for human commercial space flight? No one questions the fact that you can make money uh, with cargo. Um, but is there a closed business case? Uh, and this is what investors look at. You know, can we close the business case for human spaceflight? Oh, you, I thought you'd be kind to me today. <laughs> I, I, I thought you'd be hey, these are the things that we've been working on, Jeff. We're yeah, struggling, so, and I struggle with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, Charlie raises a really difficult question. NASA many in the United States, many around the world, take it for granted that humans go forth. I mean, Charlie is an explorer. I think I'm gonna guess uh, four times on the shuttle. Uh, yes, you flew. Um, so Charlie Bolden is an explorer. He got up in the morning and he went to space uh, four times, okay? And you just take for granted that this is part of the human spirit. But what Charlie's raising today is the tough question. How do we can make the business case to put it more uh, in the New York speech? How do we make money? Okay, and, and how do we do it? So, so right now we see it with tourism. Is that the only way we can make money? Or are we going to, you know, are we going to go down the path of factories and, and manufacturing with has human and robotic interface? So I'm not sure, for the, uh, I, uh, by having humans, it's far more expensive. You need to make sure they're safe. You need to, they have oxygen. So, so what is the business case for humans? And the answer is, that is the role of the, you know, it's either tourism or it's the role of the government to, to pave the way over the next few decades so the creativity of the human spirit can go to space. If it's um, in some sense paid for by uh, government or uh, government supports it, we want more humans to go to space. So we unleash that imagination. But boy, outside of tourism right now, that's a hard business case, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, you know, let me, uh, 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 there's a term that Jeff and I use called anchor tenant. Yeah. And that's the place for government, I believe. So I, I think Jeff agrees. For commercial space to be like commercial aviation or anything, we, you know, in, in the United States today, we have a program that's called CRAF and it's commercial support to the military, if you will. But they are, you know, commercial airplanes provide, um, the, the military provides an anchor tenant to commercial airlines uh, if they need the help in transporting military uh, troops around and the like. Not exactly what we're looking for in space, but we do need for, I think, government to remain uh, the anchor tenant for the commercial sector. So NASA flies today th uh, two to three increments, which is a, a crew of usually three to four astronauts that go to the International Space Station. Um, either NASA has to generate a, a need for more crews per year, or we have to go out and do like we're about to do with Axiom Space, uh, begin to bring commercial crews, begin to bring commercial crews to uh, to the to the International Space Station, uh, you know, to 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 be uh, part of the, the 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 people who operate there, to do biomedical development, materials processing, and the like. So I agree with Jeff. We need a big win. We need, um, you know, we've seen things like uh, doing gene sequencing already, but that's for the the people who follow that. The average man and woman down here on Earth doesn't have a clue about gene sequencing. We've got to tell our story better. So Jeff, how do we add storytelling to the, to the, to the uh, resume or the, the, the portfolio of what, what space organizations begin to do? We have to change the, you know, when, when you went to space, it was uh, government. Uh, you were an employee of NASA. Your employee of the of the government, and now we're beginning to see uh, um, we call it the democratization of space. I don't know if that's the right term, 
But we're beginning to see that more and more people who are artists, who are writers, who are musicians, uh, people, um, you know, suborbital is opening up uh, space to all sorts of people. Um, my, my boss at, uh, at Voyager, uh, Dylan Taylor, went up on the, on the last uh, uh, Blue Origin uh, New Shepard mission. And when I spoke to him, he said, Jeff, I was intellectually all ready for it. You know, I've been in space my whole career. And he said, but when I undid the belt and floated up by the window and saw finally with my own eyes, the blue dot of the earth, he said, Jeff, it was just remarkable. You got to do it. You know, so we need more people, more people who are not uh, experts, who are not researchers, who, you know, who go to space and can say, wow, that's what we need. I, I agree fully. And, you know, I'm, um, I have been pondering how we, in fact, I, I really emphasize the need for people, um, you know, to who have the opportunity to go to space. And that is still a rare, rare number of people. Um, you know, you mentioned Elon earlier. Elon has, has gone on record wanting to go to Mars and die there. Uh, and I say, I think that's crazy. And I, and I continue to say that. I can't use someone who, who makes that journey and then decides that they're gonna stay there and not come back and share the experience with the rest of humanity. Because I think it's um, the, the key to, to promoting human spaceflight is to have more and more people have that experience um, because none of us who have flown in space were emotionally ready for the experience, I think. Uh, you're hearing my grandson in the background, so I, I I apologize, and I hope we don't we don't we don't get him to take over my job here. Um, but the emotional experience uh, is something that is technically qualified and as technically prepared as you are. Uh, I haven't met anyone yet, professional or otherwise, who has been ready for the emotional experience of looking at our planet from that vantage point. So, um, when do we get artists and poets? Uh, I would love to have Amanda Gorman or Nikki Giovanni uh, go up on a space flight, whether it be orbital or suborbital. For people who don't, they're two of my favorite poets. Um, I think they would do an absolutely incredible job of helping us tell the story of what space exploration or space travel is like. What do you, you buy that? Yeah, I do. I, I do buy, and I'll say that uh, in the 90s, when I worked uh, with the Russians and the Russian space, uh, space program on the Russian space station Mir, there was a guitar that they left on the space station, and people would come up and play guitar. Um, there was uh, one cosmonaut went and did watercolors, uh, and, uh, and uh, the first um, spacewalker, uh, Alexei Leonov, he, he went on and did uh, um, watercolors and the bean the Apollo astronaut also was a painter. So we just need more of that. And, and uh, we need more of it because that's what people relate to. God help me for saying this. Uh, I'm going to guess Charlie and I are not the best examples of Instagram influencers and this sort of thing, but we probably need a couple of Instagram uh, influencers or whatever they're called, people who can really speak, who speak the language of the 20, uh, younger people to go up there. So we really need Charlie to begin to turn it over um, to folks in their 20s to, ha to handle and to communicate, not just us. I, I have to get un unmuted here, Jeff. So. Uh, um, we're going to go to questions from from our some of the listeners here pretty quickly, but but let me let me try one more time. Um, how you know what is the what is the magic ingredient to spaceflight that helps people uh, who really would benefit by going get over their fear uh, of of leaving the planet? You know, I I can remember there were people who didn't want to fly airplanes, and then all of a sudden they had their first flight. And, and, and they never look back. Um, is there a way that we help people get over their fear of, of traveling to space? Because I think that, that's an inhibition for, for some of the people who even have the money to do it, but, but won't do it just because they're afraid. M unmute. You, you unmute, Jeffrey. I'm sorry. That's an interesting question, uh, Charlie, because as you just said, uh, there's very, it's very rare to, have been an, to be an astronaut, to be a cosmonaut, to be a traveler into space. I think it's something like 600 human beings have done it. 
And um, so I think the answer to your question is more and more of us have to do it. We have to meet a neighbor, a teacher, a poet. Uh, someone has to write a, a, a song that we like and, and we know they wrote it while they were floating uh, in space, looking down at the earth. And it has to be something that, that uh, doesn't have technology, doesn't have hardware, it's the human spirit. And so we need those people who, who speak the language of the human spirit to go to space. So we rise above, literally uh, rise above the hardware. And it's no longer about the rocket. When, when I went to Europe last week, first time since the pandemic, or two weeks ago, I went to Europe. And no one asked me, did you go on a Boeing or an Airbus? No one asked me, hey, did you go on a, you know, <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, we're, we're past the point. And then maybe in the 1940s, they would say, oh, you're going to Europe? Did you go on a Pan Am Clipper or something like that? Uh, um, and so we have to get past that. We have to get past the point where in space, then no one says, did you go on uh, New Shepard? Did you go on SpaceX? Um, what hotel did you stay at? Which station did you go to? Um, oh, you went to the moon. OK, uh, we have to get to that point where it's not about the technology. It's about the, the journey. Yeah. Marcy, before I throw it over to you, let me there is one question in the chat that I particularly found interesting. And I, um, I I'll give Jeff a shot at, at trying to answer this and then I'll follow up. But it's the questioner was saying, is there is the actual geopolitical Russia, Ukraine crisis having an impact on the fast on the fast growing? And I think they mean fast growing space industry around the world, space travel business, that, that's the question. So, uh, you know, you've worked with the Russians extensively. Um, I've worked with the Russians extensively and I, I do have an opinion about this question. So I'd be interested in hearing your response. Um, first off, it, it's a personal tragedy. It's a, it's a professional tragedy. I never thought it would be a chapter, the arc in my career. I helped open the door working for the Russians. I carried over on a plane uh, the first contract for the Americans to work with the, the Soviets. And, uh, and so we thought it was a wonderful way that would be unlimited. And, and um, it's such a pity what's happening. Um, first off, there's the impact on the day to day, the International Space Station. I believe that the Russians will not withdraw from the International Space Station, um, that they will remain. Um, but the challenge to have all the nations re-up, continue the space station past 2024, 2025, I think that hill is more uh, difficult to climb up now. We'll have to see how the Russia will see the situation in Russia in not only two years, in two weeks. Um, but I think the, uh, the, the, the hill is, is higher now for the station to have the Russians in it past 2025. On a more positive note, um, I think we realize that, uh, you know, the European American alliance is very important and very strong. And I think we'll see far more relationships between Europeans and the Americans in space. Uh, we realize we have shared values and uh, uh, we'll never question each other uh, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, it's solid. Uh, and so when you go to space and you look down uh, a decade, two decades, three decades, I think we'll see more European American relationships. Uh, and so I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that, Charlie, and turn it over uh, to you, your thoughts. Yeah, I, um, I, I think I, I join you in, in what you said, you know, I, you and I both have personal friends who are very active in Roscosmos, in the Russian Space Agency. And uh, I think what would help many people understand is they're driven by a mission and they're driven by a dream of, you know, a, a world that's different than it is today. And, um, and they're working very hard, by, on my, from my information, to, to preserve the partnership between Roscosmos and NASA and, uh, and help people understand that, that you know, Every nation has its leaders, uh, good and bad, and then every nation has the, the heart and soul of the nation, which is the people it's themselves and, uh, and organizations like NASA and Roscosmos that try to do what they can to bring their nations together. And I think uh, through this will be, if we can get through this particular crisis, uh, then the, the track record of Roscosmos and NASA remaining partners and working through difficult times and bringing people together uh, will be uninterrupted. So that's, that's my hope is that we're able to hang in there and, and get through this as we did uh, the crisis in Georgia and, um, and Chechnya and other places. So I'm gonna hand it back to you, Marcy, for the Q&A part. Thank you both. Thank you both. It was really amazing. 
to hear, to listen both of you. It's amazing the knowledge and how you can disseminate uh, to the audience. So we have a lot of questions and we only have like 10 minutes. So I'm gonna try to, to throw on the table just a few of them. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, what's your opinion on the MIT technology review about the loss of 40 satellites on, a, on a SpaceX due to a genstorm or how could impact the space endeavors? I mean, it is, what is your opinion about the, the loss of 40 satellites from SpaceX? Yeah, and I think Jeff, they're asking us about, I am not, I don't, I'm not familiar with the MIT study uh, that was done. They're talking about the loss of the Starlink uh, flight about, well, not the, not the flight, but the satellites that were hit by the magnetic, geomagnetic storm and, uh, you know, found that they just were essentially useless after that. But I, I, I'm not aware of the, personally, I'm not aware of an MIT study. You have to unmute, Jeff. Uh, I'll get it down at one point. Um, um, yeah, I also am not aware of the uh, MIT study. Um, we're still in the infancy of what we understand about space. We're at the very beginning. We have many, many years to go to understand the link between cosme you know, cosmic radiation, solar flares, um, how humans really do live and work in space. So uh, I'm not familiar with it, but um, the cliche is true. Space is hard and, and they'll get over it and, and they have and they'll move on. So okay. Now moving to another topic, which is really hot right now, I guess, uh, worldwide. Any thoughts on facilitating of a space project to generate or collect energy on a space to satisfy the current energy hunger that we have on the earth? There are a lot of ideas for, for using the unique environment of space to help us on earth that we need a little more technology development to get there. And we've dreamt for a hundred years about, you know, space mirrors, about solar uh, uh, energy coming down to the earth. I believe it's in our future. I believe our future will have us using the environment of space for all sorts of energy needs here on earth. We're not there yet. Right. I mean, that's just that's just the way it is. But research is going on. And, and one day somebody will come up with a lower cost way to do this and and it will happen. So, Charlie, do you have anything on that? I, I agree. I'm uh, you know, we're looking at um, if you look at communications today, uh, we're delving more and more into laser communications to it, it doesn't speed the travel of light or communications, but it, it brings much more data down per unit time because we pack a lot of information into a into a laser beam um, the energy issue is one that's that's very difficult there are a lot of dreamers who uh you know talk about uh collecting energy on the surface of the moon and then transporting it somehow down to earth uh, i i'm i'm not a physicist i'm not a person who's been studying that but i i like jeff think that at some point um, you know, scientists and, and, and researchers are going to figure out a way to, to do these kinds of things. Okay. Uh, Charlie, I have one for you. Um, did your level of consciousness increase after your trips to, to the space? Any my level of, you mean my level of consciousness? Yes. Oh, uh, no. I, I, as any <laughs> aspect of your personality change? <laughs> Uh, no, I believe it or not, I, I hope I, I am the same person basically as I was before I left. But like I said, my perspective, and, and this is what I think happens to maybe not every single person, but to most people that I know who have had the opportunity to travel to space, whether it's low Earth orbit, uh, you know, for orbital flight or just uh, for a suborbital flight, their perspective on the planet changes because I believe you you just cannot look at our thin atmosphere and, uh, and not recognize our responsibility as stewards of this planet to, uh, to preserve that so that it enables us to live as long as we can. You know, Earth is not fragile. We, we make, I think we make a mistake when we use the term Earth is fragile because it, it takes us away from the realization that the fragile thing is us. 
this planet's been around for billions of years and it will be around for billions more. I'm not sure that we will survive it if we're not, if we're, if we don't become better stewards of our environment, clean up our atmosphere, clean up our oceans. Uh, these are all things that are really important. One, one of the things that I really like about Jeff Bezos, if I can talk about a, a particular entrepreneur, uh, you know, Jeff's dream is to move heavy industry and the things that are polluting off the planet and get them uh, into, into, into Earth orbit. Uh, such that we take away a lot of the pollution and other kinds of things that are happening down here on the earth. That's exactly what Jeff is talking about. Uh, get manufacturing of spacecraft and satellites and the like off the planet and into space so that we get the cost of launch down even further. We get the cost of satellites themselves down even further. And that's going to happen. I, I'm just not, you know, I'm, I don't have a crystal ball to say whether it's five years from now, 10 years from now, but it's going to happen. It's going to be like the airplane, if you will. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey, in the last trip you made to, uh, to Spain two weeks ago and you were in Malaga, um, what is your opinion about the space ecosystem? I guess that uh, traveling to Malaga, you will probably uh, visited um, PLD, one of the startups in yeah, Spain, and the head of space commercialization. And, and let me say that, you know, Charlie, we think we're at the center of the universe, don't we? So I go to Malaga and never mind that it's beautiful, um, but I go to this technology park and the technology park did not exist. It was started in 1994. And today there are 300 companies and 20,000 people working there. Okay. And I mean, it's this entire ecosystem. I visited two companies, one was DHV, and they're in the solar panels and CubeSats. And the other name I forget now, they work with um, Airbus on doing very sophisticated uh, components. Um, but I was also there you know, visiting the International Association of Science Parks. And it's just remarkable to see um, a community of people dedicated to how do you, I mean, some of the obvious companies, Google's there, Microsoft's there. I mean, uh, but then you have all these smaller companies and, you know, forgive me, I never heard of this place, you know, and, uh, and, and yet in its own way, it had the look and feel of a Silicon Valley. Of course, it doesn't have the capital that we have in the States uh, yet. It doesn't have that, that flow of capital. But uh, I was very, very impressed by what I saw in, in uh, Malaga and just the quality of the, of the people and, and, and everything. So um, I'm trying to think of another way back to Spain. So give me that, uh, that excuse. Yes, we will try. <laughs> so just a last question. Um, how to help countries that don't have a space agency, but have a lot of young people willing to take the plan? That, okay, I'll do that. I'm sure Charlie has some thoughts too. Um, I was very proud when I was the CEO of Nanorax, we flew the first Lithuanian satellite to space and uh, it was a group of university students. And now they have a publicly traded company called GOM Space. Uh, and, uh, or maybe I'm confusing it, but it, it was, and now they have a publicly traded company. I don't think it's GOM Space. We flew the first satellites of GOM Space. Uh, we flew um, uh, a couple of uh, nations for Peru. We flew their first satellite. So you don't need a space agency. Um, it's international. You can have a good idea. You can be university students, get together. If you're in Europe, um, there's capital, I know coming out of the federal level of Spain, there's capital on the local level. Um, there's uh, all sorts of programs now, incub incubators for this. And so it's a wonderful time to be starting out in space. And I, I know Charlie and I are a little bit envious how much yeah. it has changed. I'm speaking for you, Charlie, but how much it has changed. And so it's a great time to be young and starting out in space. And, and I let me echo what Jeff said. You know, NASA has, eh, when I left, we had more than 800 active, active uh, international agreements with more than 120 nations. In every single case, one of those agreements had to deal with STEM education, or and nowadays we call it STEM plus arts and design. But every nation in the world that wants to become a member of the family of spacefaring nations has an issue with with STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's where an agency like NASA or ESA 
or Russ Cosmos or anybody on the planet can, can team with, with small countries that want to get into the space business to help them uh, with STEM education for their students. That will begin to generate the kind of interest and the kind of participation, you know, that Jeff has talked about today. I, I, I loved it when Jeff uh, worked with, I think they did, uh, was it St. Thomas uh, More? There was an elementary school in Arlington, became yes. the first elementary school to build a CubeSat, send it to the International Space Station and have it deployed. Now think about that. You know, kids that are, that are in elementary school building a satellite and sending it to space and then having signals come back, radio signals come back from their satellite. That's what we have. That's you've got a crawl, walk, run. And so I would say for a lot of the smaller nations, let's help them to crawl, uh, get their STEM educations going as well as they can, and then gradually get them into various levels of space flight. Um, everybody's not going to be able to do human space flight. So so let's let's not start there trying, you know, trying to encourage every nation of the world to have a, an astronaut or so. But but let's start with the basics and we'll we'll work up to it. But, Okay, I just one last, last thought to throw to the audience before we, uh, we close. Uh, as I said, it's a wonderful time to be starting out in this industry. This industry, uh, it's a community, it's great people, it's uh, the future, it's part of the survival of the, of the species, the human species. It, you can go into it to be an engineer, you can go into it, as Charlie's saying, one day to be a poet or musician. So it's a, it's a great time, if any questions, please do reach out and, um, and I wish everyone the best of luck. Yes, we want to try to to send all the questions from the audience that we, we couldn't because of a question of time. So we will we will have later on. So thank you both. Thank you so much. It's a real pressure and an honor for us to have you today. And um, thank you to the audience for joining to this webinar. And we will keep in the future to, uh, to holding more uh, future talks. Thank you. Take care. Take care, Bye. guys.